Well, it was William Shakespeare who said, cometh the hour, cometh the man, which means that when there's a real challenge, you need the right person to step into it. And clearly what God has seen in Nehemiah, a cupbearer for a king, a rather domestic sort of role, he saw in him the right stuff to make him a man who was going to bring transformation to the nation of Israel and Jerusalem. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to see how it is that he begins this journey of leading his people to Jerusalem and how he's going to pick up on what's going on there. And what we're going to see is how Nehemiah has been able to draw from the stories of the past, the stories of his own people, uh, meet that with real-time connections with God right now, and then project a hope to a group of people who are very dispirited about how their future can be different to their present. And that in itself is something we want for today, don't we? Uh, Nehemiah, in this text today, he says, you see the trouble. You see the trouble we are in. And often we look around in our world, and particularly today, we wake up and the Ukraine, Ukraine's been invaded and we had record numbers of COVID. You see the trouble and you go, oh my goodness, there's trouble, where's God? There's trouble, where's God? So we're just going to have a look at how Nehemiah begins this journey as he's got permission from the king to head off to Jerusalem, had a leave of absence, been sent by the king, resourced by the king, and away he goes. He says this, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Let's just stop there for a second. It's those first four words that I think are quite profound to start off with. It says, um, I went to Jerusalem, just like I went to the dairy and got an ice cream. He just traveled 1,300 kilometers with an entourage of soldiers and, and, and people who were going to support him, the logistics of food. Uh, he's already been given permission to raid the king's forest to get the wood for the temple, uh, sorry, for the, for the gates. And so here we have this incredible logistical exercise that Nehemiah doesn't barely even mention. And I think it's remarkable when it gives you an idea of who this guy is. This guy is about the purpose. He's about the end goal. He's not there writing a story about celebrating his logistical ability or whatever else might be involved in traveling that sort of distance. But you get this understate, understated nature of Nehemiah starting to come through. It's always about glorifying God. It's never about glorifying yourself. So he just says, I went to Jerusalem. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, great. Just like, you know, I just went to London, you know. So here we are. And we need to go back and look at this because these verses give us a setup for why it is that Nehemiah is such a fantastic leader and a guy who we can learn so much from. He says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. So he was on a horse and there were a few others with him. And he goes out and this is the first time that he's actually been able to see the project that God has given him. He's heard reports about how the walls had tumbled down and the gates had been burnt and that broke his heart. And so here he is now in this place, having traveled 1,300 kilometers to be now looking at these walls and he's gone out at night. He doesn't want to let anybody know what it is that he's up to and we're told that he hasn't actually told anybody about this. Now, when we say anybody, that would mean his entourage as well. Because if the entourage that traveled with him had known what his purpose was, word would have got out within five minutes as to why you're here. No one knew. And so therefore, we can see in Nehemiah um, somebody who's actually has, has this internal uh, ability and strength not to get ahead of himself. And sometimes this is a really important thing to do. And just to reinforce this, um, just at four verses further down, we see it, Nehemiah says again these same words. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing because as yet I'd said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. He hadn't told them about anything. And so for him, keeping the vision close to his heart gives him time to test it. Now, you might say that lacks faith, that lacks integrity. You know, surely you're the king is now backing you and you're going to rebuild these walls. Well, he didn't have any idea what state Jerusalem was really in. And you got to appreciate that in this day and age, if somebody's city, somebody's town falls apart, it wasn't unusual for the people down the road to go to that city that's fallen down and flog all the bricks, flog all the stones, and you build your own city wall down the road. Okay, archaeologists find this going on all the time where people have flogged each other's walls, you know? 
have a party at one end of town, come back and the neighbours have stolen your wall. It's just, you know, that's just the way it was. Bricks and stones, nicely, neatly cut, were a valuable commodity to be reused again and again through generation after generation. But Nehemiah was holding all of this to himself. He didn't let anybody know what his end game was. And maybe he was in a situation where he was worried that he'd bit off more than he could chew, you know? And uh, you can see why they're called a king fisher, can't you? You know, he's, he's, a, he's a fisher king, all right? There's no doubt about it. My guess is that that one got away. I don't know how he would have eaten that fella. But anyway, all credit to him. Man, how did he fly with that in his mouth? So biting off more than you can chew is the first lesson that you have to learn when you're, trying, when you're being a leader. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. And sometimes you need to be very calculated about what it is that you are planning to do. Take one step at a time, build your confidence, see how this is going to work out. So Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, and this is what he's on about. And it says here, I'll re- reinforce it again. He says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Now, the thing about this wall, and I mean, this is from Nehemiah's Facebook, actually. Um, so just, just to give you an idea of what he was experiencing. Um, this is essentially, I think, what Jerusalem would look like. It had been sacked, completely sacked by the Babylonians. Uh, in this time, when the people were starting to return from captivity, as they came back, Zerubbabel, the first prophet, to bring some people back, built the temple, okay, a little version of the great temple of, um, of, of the people. And so, therefore, there's this little bit of work being done, but they've run out of energy. they run out of vision. they run out of uh, energy to, to do what it is that they could do, but now they're dispirited. The thing about this nation, this unique nation called Israel, is that they were perpetually living the story of God. And as Christians, this is what we're called to do too. We're called to live the story of God, the story that's been lived before by people who've gone before us and the story that's being lived now and the story that's going to be lived in the future. If you've been a Christian for 20 years, you carry 1% of the Christian story over a 2,000-year period. So Jeremiah would have had the echoes, the echoes of the prophets who were in this town before he turned up. These are the stories he would have heard. The prophecies of Zephaniah, the prophecies of Nahum, people who were there at the time saying, look, we're going to be overwhelmed, but God is going to push back on the Assyrians. They're not going to last too long, too much longer. You know, and these, these prophecies came through. But the person who did the most amount of negotiation with God and with the people was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an amazing guy because he got to see so much of what he prophesied being outworked. It wasn't like an old dude who prophesied fell over and people go, hey, you might have got it right. No, Jeremiah lived through all of this. He was there when the Babylonians came and he was taken away into captivity. Jeremiah's words would have been echoing around these broken down walls. Let's capture some of them. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Wow, there's your opening shot. That's your opening chapter of Jeremiah. This is what he was called to tell the people. There's a boiling pot above us, and it's going to be poured out upon us. There's nothing worse than being scolded and burnt with water, is it? It's terrible. What an image. But Jeremiah tells them why. It says, their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshipping what their hands have made. So here's Jeremiah pointing it out. This is what you guys have been doing. This is what made, made God so angry. And uh, I've been patient, I've been patient, I've been patient. But now there comes a time when this tough love is poured out upon you. And you see, Jeremiah, his words would have been echoing through the stories passed down from generation to generation. Even when they would have been in Babylon, they would have said, oh gosh, if only we'd listened to Jeremiah, he had it right. 
If only we'd repented. If only we'd turned things around. Maybe God would have relented and held off this punishment that we are due. You see the trouble. And there's no doubt that Jeremiah saw the trouble because the stories of Jeremiah in this time when the Babylonians have besieged the city of Jerusalem are quite profound. See, Jeremiah's in the city and the Babylonians are all around them besieging them and food is getting short and everybody's getting desperate. And um, this guy comes in, he's actually a relation of Jeremiah's and he says, I've got a field, does anybody want to buy it? You know, it'd be a little bit like New Zealand knowing that some foreign nation is about to invade and take over and then you go and say, oh, is it, um, you know, does anybody want to buy my car? Even though you know that there's never going to be any more petrol to, you know, use it. So here is this guy and he comes into Jerusalem. He's been chased in by the Babylonians and he comes and then he says, I've got a field. I've got a field. Anybody want to buy my field? And Jeremiah goes, yeah, I'll buy your field. And so we've got this in chapter 32, we've got this story there of the transaction that goes on and he pays the silver for the field. They write out a title deed, they get it witnessed, it tells you all this. Then he puts it in a clay pot and they sneak out the city and they bury it in the field. Why did Jeremiah do that? Because he said, this is to prove to you that I am confident that our God is going to bring us back here one day. And when that happens, I'm going to have a field and God is going to bless the soil and God is going to bless and prosper us again. Wouldn't that be an incredible picture of hope when you're surrounded by the enemy? Even though you know that this is essentially something that you as a nation deserve and you've been warned about, Jeremiah goes, ah, we've still got a future. We've still got a future. And I'm going to prove to you by taking my own money and buying some land so that I can prove that I have confidence that we will return. And then after this, Jeremiah says this, and this is where Nehemiah would have been building his hope. It said, you are saying about the city, by the sword, famine, and plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. Wow. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah is living off this. He's living off this. This is his hope. He's been called by God, but he knows that he stands in this tradition of the prophets. He knows the words of Jeremiah that have been passed down from generation to generation. And here he is, and he's wondering to himself, God, am I actually part of this restoration? Am I invested? Am I built in, painted in this picture of restoration that you've prophesied through Jeremiah as we know it in chapter uh, 32? Wow, what, a, what an incredible Incredible experience for this guy to think that he is actually part of something prophesied from generations ago to be the one who's going to bring about this return, this homecoming. What a, what a great thing to do, isn't it? This is a wonderful place to be. So Nehemiah saw through the rubble to a time of renewal. And that in itself is a picture of hope that the rest of this nation didn't have. Remember, they'd built the temple and they'd run out, just run out of vision ran out of energy, ran out of resources, ran out of hope. And now they had this broken down wall around them and there was nothing there to give them any confidence, any identity. And here comes a guy into town and he has a different story. But the question when we look at this bigger picture of Nehemiah for us, the question is about our own lives, isn't it? And we ask that question, what's the rubble that presently blocks your vision? Okay, what is it? What's happening right now? What's the challenge you're facing? I know that we all know that COVID is uh, intimidating. It's around us. We, we can get sick from it. We don't sure how sick we'll get. So there's a concern. But there's challenges for us too that have come over the last couple of years. Maybe friendships or family that are now disconnected from you. Okay, because COVID has broken down the walls. COVID has burnt the gates. COVID has 
busted up those relationships. And, and you're looking at the world as it is, and you're wondering if it ever will be rebuilt. You're wondering how we can actually change this. How can I reconcile with my neighbor, reconcile with my work colleague, reconcile with my son or daughter or brother or sister or whoever it might be that you've had a disagreement about with these things? There's so much out there that we can disagree over now. It's such a challenge, isn't it? So Nehemiah has a vision, and it points toward or forward to a day of restoration. And he's the only guy in this place who carries this vision. Everybody else has given up. They just said, can't be done. It could be done, it would have been done, but it hasn't been done, so it can't be done. Yeah? Somebody's just saying the past determines the future. Because if somebody, in, if it could be done, somebody in the past would have done it. Well, that's not the way it works. And so here we have Nehemiah, and he says this. And then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Now, talk about understatements. It doesn't happen that way, does it? You don't just go, hey, guess what? We can rebuild. The king just sent me and everybody goes, yay, let's start. Uh, this is a summary, right? This is a summary of what might have taken days. And, and yet Nehemiah has appealed to them. He's appealed to the negative side of what they're experiencing. He said to them, uh, if we rebuild this war, we will no longer be in disgrace. Wow. Disgrace? Absolutely. Not only disgrace, but they had no wall. They had no safety. They had no security at all. They had no identity. They had no culture. They had businesses would have been uh, overwhelmed. You know, you couldn't do anything valuable because someone would come and steal it. Families would have been dispirited. People would have just felt useless. And this is why Nehemiah says this word disgrace. Indeed, they were in disgrace. They just had no corporate identity. You know, it's a, it's a cool thing to have a corporate identity, isn't it? You know, look at the nation of New Zealand. We live here. And, you know, you, you say things like, um, when a sports team does well, didn't we do well? You know, when they win. Yeah, didn't we do well? I had tears in my eyes when I saw the, that rowing eight win the Olympic gold. Out of nowhere. I have to be careful I don't cry now. <laughs> it's just awesome. Didn't we do well? When we lose, we go, didn't they do badly? But when we win, we go, didn't we do well? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. And, and so you have this corporate identity that's built around um, all these amazing things that you know you can do when you provide the infrastructure for people to prosper. You know, governments and nations invest in education so the next generation can take hold of what that foundation is and they build upon it. And so it goes on. And yet for Nehemiah, Nehemiah he finds himself caught in this in-between moment. And this is where he becomes the leader God wants him to be. Because he's going to turn vision into reality. He's going to turn a bunch of old rubble into something that is going to stand for something again. But he arrived and he didn't put it all out there straight away because he had to, in his own head, in his own heart, take a vision and then start to calculate how it was going to work. And we've all had trouble in the past. I'm sure at some stage when you said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then six months later you go, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. Why? Because I had a whole lot of unforeseen problems. That's what happens sometimes. That's what happens. I can uh, remember some years ago, uh, Michaela and I and our son Taylor were down in Wanaka for a few months. We were having a sabbatical break. And um, beautiful hills all around Wanaka. And I said to my son Taylor at the time, 14, I said, hey, do you want to go for a hunt for a couple of days up on those hills? I said, uh, I've been told about a track up there we can go and see, what, see what's up there. So we spent a day or so packing our gear and uh, we had to carry all the water because there's no water up there, so real hot day. <clears throat> so off we go and we start climbing up hills, start climbing up steeper hills, steeper and steeper hills. Then you're hanging on branches trying to climb up hills. And we got up somewhere and I said, I don't know where we're going to spend the night, mate. And he goes, no, neither do I. Because in the little valleys that there were, they were just covered in matagari and rose bushes and that spear grass, that Spanish spear grass, that's wicked, that stuff. And yet when you're out of the 
the valleys, you're on a side of a hill like that. So if you went to sleep on the side of the hill like that, you'd end up in that lot. So it just didn't work out. And so we honestly was just razorback ridges everywhere we went. And we got up to a certain height and we could look back down over the lake to Wanaka. And I said, mum's over there. I said, let's go home. <laughs> let's go home. Well, that didn't work out. We had great plans, great ambition, but it just didn't work out. There was nowhere to slip, steep, uh, sleep and, and everything was so steep. And you see, we do these things. We make plans sometimes and they fall apart. Yeah, that's what happens. We're not worried about that. It's just that's the reality. Nehemiah had kept it close to his heart what God had put on his heart to ensure that he could actually convince himself that there was a pattern and a plan that God was going to put into place. Now, it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have traveled the 1,200 kilometers to Jerusalem. He couldn't have seen it if he hadn't have got going. And he knows that getting things going is what a leader does. So all things look good for Nehemiah, don't they? Because the people are saying, come on, we can do it. Let's do it. We'll build this thing. Nehemiah's going, yay, great. We're going to have something going on here. The next words that we hear from Nehemiah is this. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? This is a leader's biggest challenge always. A leader's biggest challenge is the mockers and the scoffers, the people who push back and say, you shouldn't do that, you should do this. Why are you doing that? Who are you to do that? And mocking and ridicule is your first barrage against a leader. And it's very, very easy to do because what you're trying to do is you're trying to undermine the confidence that somebody has, okay? And you know that you've made mistakes in the past. So when you're ridiculed and mocked, that sort of taps into the fact that, hey, I'm not perfect and I don't think I've got it all together. But sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes I do have it right and I can work. When I was at secondary school, um, it was a year, it was fifth form, year 11, I was playing rugby essentially for the third 15 at the time. And uh, of course, when you're at school, the idea is that you get to play for the first 15, uh, which, I, which I did. It was a good time. But in my year, fifth form year or my year 11 year, um, the school put out a note saying, anybody who's interested in a rugby tour to Australia next year with the first 15, come to this meeting. And so I thought, Oh, I'll go and see what that's all about. So I wandered in there. I wasn't as big as the other guys because I was fifth former or seventh formers. You know, they, they were shaving twice a day and I was, <laughs> I was still popping pimples, you know. And, um, and so I rolled in there and um, listened to what was going on and I walked out and a mate of mine said, were you just in that meeting? <clears throat> I said, yeah. And he says, do you think you're going to be in the first 15 next year? I said, well, I don't know. I might be. I know that they're going to take more than just 15 players to Australia. Oh, who do you think you are? Seriously, who do you think you are? You're not that good. I'm like, oh, but I might get better. And he never went to Australia. I went to Australia. Yeah. You see, the mockers and the scoffers are those around you who just poo-poo some ideas. They knock you back. They push you down. They just try to stop you getting any sort of traction. Yeah. And it's, 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 um, it's hard on your spirit, you know? It's hard on your spirit when that happens. But they're taking lob shots, and we see here also what these guys are doing to Nehemiah because it says uh, in that last line you see it, there says, a question, are you rebelling against the king? Which tells you how ignorant they are because the king has actually sent them, him and his entourage here. Nehemiah is operating under the authority of the king. Okay, so they're taking big lob shots. But don't worry, they're going to get a lot more accurate. As time goes on, as the stakes get higher, as more is at risk and the operation is pulling in more people, these guys are going to get better at undermining him. But you're going to see Nehemiah, as we unfold this, you're going to see him come back with a, an absolute master class of how to be a leader. You see, as leaders, you will see trouble. As leaders, you can't escape trouble. It doesn't matter what you do, someone's going to see it as being the wrong thing to have done. And, uh, you know, it's just, just the way it is. Um, and the challenge that we face is how do we protect our heart, how do we protect our spirit from that criticism? 
I can uh, roll my clock back a few years, not too long ago, when I was the Baptist national leader and uh, I had the unenviable task of leading the denomination through a big conversation about whether Baptist churches should take same-sex marriages. Okay, so, I mean, the, the ultimate conclusion was, was a, a affirmation that marriage was between a man and a woman and that we will stick to that tradition. But there was few out there who said, no, 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 you've got to really, we've got to go with this, otherwise we'll be left behind. I'm like, no, we'll stick with God and we'll, we'll let him work the rest out. So it took two and a half years for this process to happen. I had literally, I would have had literally over 100 meetings of that period of time with churches and groups of churches, groups of pastors, groups of leaders. Anyway, um, I was only about six months having finished this whole, as a whole, and I get this uh, uh, email from somebody, um, a woman, and she, um, she said, uh, Dear Craig, I've been reading a book that tells me that I can only love Jesus to the same degree that I love the person that I hate the most. You with me? Love the person that I hate the most. So I'm reading this. And then she says, um, so I'm just writing to you to forgive you because you're the person I hate the most. <laughs> I was like, I barely, I think I know you. I think I might have met you. But I've been living rent-free in her head for, for years, man. I've been living rent-free in her head for years. And so she wrote to me and she said, I forgive you. So I wrote back and I said, that's great. I'm glad you've forgiven me. I know that we're always going to see the world differently. I'm glad by doing this, it gets it off your chest and you can you know, have the right relationship with God. God bless, have a nice life. But, you know, there are, this was for me was a, a real insight into how it is that people can project upon others worst case scenarios. You know, you can build up this, this imagination in your head and your heart about somebody else. It's a really strange thing. But what I've found, here's a, here's a simple truth, is that people are way better in the flesh than they are in your imagination. You can sit around and think, oh, that person's a this and a that. Then you sit and have a coffee with them, you walk away and go, oh, they're actually all right. Yeah, they always were all right. It was your imagination that had the problem. Yeah? And so Nehemiah is going to face this. He's going to face a history of people who carry a story where they don't want to see Jerusalem prosper. They don't want to see Nehemiah do what he does well, and that's cast vision and lead. And so Nehemiah now is on this journey, and we're going to see what I said, a master class in how to lead in adversity because he walks into this spiritual battle. A physical battle is looming, but he still wants to get on with the purpose of rebuilding these walls. For some of you, there are broken down walls that you can rebuild. It could be business that just needs a shot of faith, a little bit more energy, and you're going to get over this lump and hump we call COVID. Relationships have broken down because you haven't give, given each other time to speak. Maybe people have become aggressive towards you. Maybe you've become aggressive towards them. But it's an opportunity to rebuild and to have hope. And the thing that Nehemiah did is that he actually would put himself into the future, in his imagination, and he was living as if these walls were built. He wasn't worried about bricks. He was just celebrating the day that families were going to thrive, businesses were going to prosper, culture was going to be restored, the temple worship was going to be celebrated. People were going to be rejoicing in the fact that Jerusalem had a wall and that disgrace is removed forever. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to look ahead of this COVID scenario and say, what am I going to be able to do now that I would have regretted not doing in six months or 12 months' time. As much as it is up to each of us, we're told we should make peace with all people. Let's finish with this last bit of scripture from Nehemiah. It says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. 
I doubt many of you have got walls to rebuild physically. But to apply this, 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 this promise, really, that we can begin this good work, it sits with all of us, doesn't it? Every one of us. There's always a good work we can do, particularly in the context of relationships, particularly in the context of what's going on in our lives today. We can reach out to people who have isolated you or isolated themselves. You can still extend that olive branch of peacemaking to them. You can pick it up because you've got, like Nehemiah, the opportunity to project forward and say, I don't want Christmas next year to be like the one we just had. I don't want mum's birthday next year to be like the one we just had. I don't want that holiday that we couldn't have to be the same thing that we have next year. So they began this good work. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we look at a physical restoration, a rebuilding of a wall some two and a half thousand years ago. And yet the, the power of that story and the illustration that it carries for us is so relevant today. Lord, we pray for our communities, we pray for our, our families, we pray for our churches, pray for our businesses, our families, Lord, throughout, we just ask that as much as it is up to us that we can do the work of rebuilding, that we can put in place things that are a strategy to attempt to make the future different to the past because of the problems that have come upon us. And so, Lord, in this space today, we all take responsibility for that but we're going to need you to guide us so that we can be gentle with others and gentle with ourselves, that we can put things right where they've been wronged and we can build a greater future than the, the rubble that we're walking through at the moment. So God, bless us with your presence. You've said in your word that if we lack wisdom, we can ask and you can give it to us generously without finding fault. You pour it into our lives. And so we ask for that. Be our God, walk closely with us as we try to walk closer with others. So we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, team.